I went at Don's invitation at some stage with Jonathan Ross to Sunset Strip, just as a, on a research mission, of course. And uh, Jonathan Ross and I both had to leave because we were laughing so much because one of the girls, as she was removing her bra, said to one of the punters at the front, are you a member of Equity? And he said, no. And she said, well, get your fucking feet off the stage then. Which <clears throat> which is an old joke, but when somebody's doing it as they're removing their bra, it just made us laugh so much. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This is part two of an interview with an award-winning comedian, writer and podcast host, Kevin Day. Welcome back to the Humorology podcast. Uh, thank you, Paul. To to paraphrase the old joke, they say you do the Humorology podcast twice in your career, once on the way up, once on the way down. So it is good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant well what we established last time was we we actually first met in i think in 85 or 86 i can't remember uh, uh, at the uh, comedy well, store i think of a joke that i would have done i would have done happily 30 years ago that was about sex or relationships and you now think no it's not it's not right it's not appropriate yeah. it's just it just becomes sad and when you see older comics when you see older comics doing the same stuff they were still doing 30 years ago, it's just like there comes a time when you you have to stop doing that. And you, there comes a time when you slightly lose the act, not the energy, but you lose the anger and you haven't got the energy to to display the energy in a strange sort of way. If you see what I mean, so you I find that my comedy, I want to reflect on stage how my life is going and how I view things differently. But also it's easy to do that now because my audience has grown up with me the audience and this can be for business or anything need to know i know who that is it's about finding that essence which i think takes comedians even the best of comedians two or three years to to, to work out what that is but it's also and again as you say this is a good lesson for business and industry it's about finding your voice your authenticity if you like but also it's about saying okay this is it now i've set my parameters i don't think I'm capable of doing something else. You know, and it's, it's like when you're, it, 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 it's like I was involved in recruitment and industrial relations. And I was really happy being involved in, in those areas of work, but I wasn't happy when I had to be involved in disciplinary proceedings and, and uh, sacking people. I hated that area of the world, I hated it. So there comes a time when you go, you say to people, Look, I, I'm, not, I'm not a natural at that. I don't want to do that. I can, if, I will if you want me to, of course I will. But I'm much better suited to this. And it's the same as a performer. There comes a stage when, as those four people said to me that night, it's like you, you go, right, OK, this is what I am. And I'm good at this. I'm very good at this. And I can continue to be better at this. But if I, if I go, if I start to learn a guitar, that won't be me. If I start trying to do one-liners, that won't be me. And audiences, yeah. audiences see through that. Audiences are so clever. I, somebody some, somewhere needs to write a book about the psychology of an audience because it's so interesting how one person reacts to a joke compared to 10 compared to a hundred Nick Revel and I, Nick was brilliant. We, we used to have this oh, thing that, that comics every now and again, a comic would go out into the room, into the comedy store as the audience is taking their seats and, and they'd say, I'm just going to read the room and we go fine, fine. But Nick and I were experienced enough to know that it's, yeah, you go out and you read the room and you think, <laughs> this, this is going to be tough. They look really volatile audience. And you go on stage and they're nothing of the sort. Yeah. Or you think, oh, they're going to be really quiet. And you go on stage because that moment of the lights going up and, and the, the, the offstage mic announcing the compare or the compare announcing, it changes the dynamic of a room full of people. I, and again, I found this when I was training people at the ambulance service. The, the, so officers would turn up and you, there'd be tea beforehand. And these were officers, some of whom I'd taken part, I'd, I'd recruited some of them. I knew most of them. 
to speak to at social things and you'd be having a cup of tea with them so there's 10 officers here for a training module you'd be having a cup of tea a biscuit you'd be chatting about football you'd be chatting about then as soon as you went into the, the room and you sat them down and your body overhead projector or whatever the antiquated equipment we had back in those days the dynamic changed completely because suddenly they're all looking at you your status is now completely different and it's the same as when you go on stage an audience a room full of 100 200 a thousand people go from being a thousand individuals to an audience yeah. and they you know, as you know comedians are the worst audience possible the oh. last thing you want to see is comedians sitting watching because they never <laughs> laugh no they just don't laugh it's, it's because they're always second guessing what's going on yeah. they're always thinking would i have finished that the same way or that even if you even if they say something brilliant or that be, yeah it's a collective thing where by a, an audience full of comedians will all nod at the same time at a brilliant <laughs> gag and go, <laughs> funny. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like the people in the Shakespeare audience, you get the joke. We know from history that in, in Shakespearean times, audiences were very volatile. Were very, you had to keep them entertained. Shakespearean plays, most people don't realise, were full of business. They were full of business. They were full of slapstick. They were full of jokes. Just to, even in, in Victorian times, you see this history of the music hall. Again, music. The, the phrase bringing the house down comes from the Hackney Empire, where there was a bar right at the back of the Hackney Empire where most people gathered. They didn't sit to watch that. They gathered at the bar, the house, as they call it, the, the audience. And if you were good, they would come down from the bar to sit and watch. So you've brought the house down, so you were good. But so, so how is it that, that from even back in sort of 1910, audiences were eating, booing, jeering. My nan used to talk about going to silent movies and how it was just, she said the, the films were silent, but the cinema bloody wasn't. Because it's just people talking, <laughs> shouting at the screen, reading the things out. So we've gone from that to an audience now when the curtain opens, for the most part, absolute hush. Yeah. Audience reaction. So even that, so the audiences have changed in 100, 300 years. And I find that I find that fascinating. And I think what's going to happen is that the more the more people access comedy, music, even theatre and dance through YouTube, through the Internet, the less they're going to know how to behave when they when they go to a live. But my, my big worry is that people's attention spans are getting shorter. There's no doubt about that. I've, I've always had the attention span of a toddler, so I'm being hypocritical here. But you you do find people, you, know, you talk to TV producers, you know, the famous Andre Previn sketch with Morecambe and Wise. Yes. It's 14 minutes long. Right? It's 14 mm -hmm. minutes long, and it was full of references to classical music. I spoke to a TV producer recently who said, if you had a sketch now and it's two and a half minutes long, you trim it. And you certainly wouldn't fill it full of references to classical music. I worry about comedy workshops. There's so many comedy workshops now, comedy courses. Yeah. Because I think comedy is one of the things that you can't, and I say this as an ex-training officer, I think one of the things you can't teach, you can teach practical things, you can teach people how to take a microphone out of stand, but what worries me about those comedy courses is that you see people who for 12 weeks while they're on the course are surrounded by love and friendship and people saying to them each other, no, you're great, you've got this. I did a couple of Zoom classes for, for Swansea University during lockdown and they're all great, they're all really interesting and you try and say to them, this is where you go. But when they come out of these courses and they've, they're left to their own devices, suddenly they're confronted with the real, with the real world. It, it, it's, it's, it's very much like a policeman or an ambulance man or a nurse or a teacher who's, who's done the training who's done the, the modules, they've done the, uh, the, the walkthroughs, for want of a better word, they've done the mocks, they've been shadowing people, and then suddenly it's the first day on the ward or the first day on the beat or the first day on an ambulance, and everything they've learned, been taught, goes out of the window. It's any, any boxer will tell you every plan you have for every fight goes out the window when you're punched in the face for the first time. Uh, yeah, well, it's the old fo the football analogy is uh, good on paper, shit on, on grass. grass. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and my boss was at the ambulance service, was a very big monster. He, he was the one, and this was back in the 80s, remember, when you know, personnel wasn't as forward thinking as it is now. It's like we would lose staff and he would he was the one who was spotting patterns and going well hang on a second we're losing a lot of staff from one particular station or one particular district or we're losing a lot of um staff from one particular training intake so is there a problem with recruitment is there a so rather than us blaming the staff rather than us going this person's not working 
we need to get rid of this person. Why did we not find out, first of all, why we took them on in the first place? Because somebody must have thought they were good at their job. Why do we not find out why their boss isn't encouraging them to be better? Why is our first port of call sacking them rather than we're potentially losing a really good uh, member of staff here? And perhaps if we just take a couple of hours to work out if, you know, is there a common theme going on? Is there one particular training officer whose standards are not as high as, as others? Is there one particular divisional officer whose disciplinary standards are not as high as others? Is, is, it, is it recruitment? Is it, is it somebody from personnel that's not paying enough attention? Are we not looking at references well enough? And that was a lesson that I learned again, because you find out, it's not a holistic approach, but you find out what the problem is, because half the time it turned out the problem was with the organisation and not with the individual. And once you highlight what that, what that is, you, you either admit that you've made a mistake and you, you get rid of somebody, or you, you change the system to make sure you don't make that mistake in future. And hopefully you retain a good member of staff just by tweaking your training a little bit or your disciplinary procedure. But it was, until then, the, the, the thing was always been, he's no good at a job, she's no good at a job, out they go. You can't go, they're an idiot because they, uh, they done that. Oh, hold on, how did we communicate with them? What was what did we do? You know, oh God, the people in accounts are so stupid. I've told them six <laughs> times. Actually, take responsibility. That's really interesting, Paul, because that reflects again, it's become a cliche, but it reflects the binary nature of communication in, in modern society, in that you, you you very rarely hear the words, oh, you might have a point there, because we've all become so entrenched. It's like, no, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And there's and that's it, there's no point having this discussion because you of course we saw this with brexit we saw this with all sorts of things i was i was disappointed that you know i voted uh, remain of course i did but i say why do I, why do I say of course even by saying of course i did i'm, I'm making a value judgment but i voted remain yeah. but i i know people who didn't and instead of going to you fucking idiot you've ruined my life you, you'd say well you know can we talk about why you did that what are the reasons you did that jeff norcott for example is a comedian he's a very good comedian talked about it in fact he was openly brexit but he had he knew more about the eu than i did and he had this thing about the underrepresentation of women on committee so you you talk to people and you find these things out so we had an issue at, at crystal palace recently a, a french footballer uh it just a gay refused to wear france had a, a day of uh, gay pride and the captains of each french team were asked to wear a rainbow armband and he refused to do so because he said he's, he's a devout muslim and he's from Senegal, where uh, home, homosexuality is legal. It always has been. So, and a, a Crystal Palace player, Czech Kiyati, uh, tweeted a message. It looked like a message of support. It, it's, it's, it's a matter of interpretation, but it looked like a message of support for his friend. And there were so many Palace fans of a liberal left persuasion who went, well, you can never play for the club again. And you go, well, hang on a second. So I, I, I think it's really regrettable if, if he... If he is tweeting a message of support for homophobia, then I'm really upset by that. But again, he's another one from Senegal, he's another devout Muslim. Surely the first port of call would be, let's let's organise a meeting with him and some people from Palace and Proud, the LGBTQ Palace fans. Let's let's talk to him about his beliefs. Let's explain to him that expressing those beliefs is is going to upset some other people. Let's not go right. I disagree with him. Therefore, he's wrong therefore get rid of him because that's what's happening too often across all levels of, of society everything it's well i mean it's not the, there is even a word for it now which is cancelling isn't it really? yes it's, it's, yeah yeah i mean i i can kind of it's interesting talking to ed about this because to his generation this is second nature um and and yeah, especially around issues of, of sexual identity which for you know for our generation you tend not to get involved because you there's no right you can't say do right for doing wrong because my my, my I just wake up in the morning. I just want everyone to be happy. I just want everyone to get through the day fed, taught, housed, uh, you know, happy. I don't, as long as they don't want to kill people, then I, I'm not fussed about their sexuality, their sexual identity, their religion. I will try and get on with everybody. I don't believe that men transition to women. I don't believe they take 10 years of this physical and psychological shocking process just so they can see Sandy Toxvig in the shower. I, I, I don't believe that. At the same time, I don't see why JK Rowling as a woman isn't allowed to express disquiet about 
But and Ed says, "Again, I'm sorry, Ed, you've got to pick a side. You know, you've and you've got to be one or the other." And it's like, why? Why can't I try and see both? But that, trying to see both sides of the argument seems to be hopelessly old-fashioned. But what what's interesting, I think that might be part of my industrial relations training at the ambulance service because, in a sense, you you have to try and see both sides of the argument. Although you're representing management to an extent, you have. I, I've always said that every strike, every strike, and of course they're few and further between now because of government legislation but every strike is a failure of management every every strike is not to do with greedy workers or disgruntled workers if your staff go on strike it's management's fault because you've got so many stations you've got so many key moments when you could have avoided that strike and it takes two sides to make a strike so you can either be the intransigent management who goes there's no point in us having this meet this meeting these are the rules these are the regulations you have to abide by them or you can be the sort of industrial relations manager who goes, why are these people upset? Is there something we can do that doesn't cost us money to change the situation? You can, at the very least, be polite to the people that you're dealing with who are representatives of your workforce. And, and of course, as a, when I was an industrial relations manager, you, we were dealing then with like five different unions because it was a throwback to the sort of 40s and 50s when they're all very specific craft unions. Uh, we had people like Jeremy Corbyn, who was the Newpy, I think, I think Newpy South East. So he was, we would see him occasionally. He was a big union convener. And we would occasionally, uh, we've gone quite well with him, but occasionally we, we, would, we would say, oh, by the way, we're going to offer you a 100% pay rise. Because we knew that instinctively you go, no. It's not, it's not <laughs> but again, but if it, at least you can make the meetings. What you can do, because quite often what we found was that trade union representatives knew the law, the employment law, every bit as well as we did, if not better. All right? And and sometimes it becomes a game, but it's really important for anybody in management to, to communicate, not just to instinctively dig the heels in and go, oh, God, of course, they're unhappy. It, you know, it might be it might be that your workforce is unhappy because there's 20 of them in a small room making 200 phone calls a day. And if they don't. They're going to be sacked. That might be a reason why they're unhappy. So I always think that the duty of a responsible employer is to find a way to make them more productive, not to find a way to get more out of them. Well, and 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 that involves, which is a big part of humorology, listening. If you stop learning, you might as well give up. And I, I always, I'm not, I'm not just talking about facts here. I'm not just talking about watching the documentary and you go, "Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that about George III. I'll stop. I'll store that up and use that in a conversation and pretend. I, I researched it myself, but it's about it's about having a conversation with somebody and going, oh, hang on a second, what was that? And they repeat without any belief, and they say uh, blah blah blah, and you go, oh, all right, that's that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before, and it might not change your opinion, but you might go, do you know what? You go home and say to Ali, actually, I, I've been thinking about that issue, and and Bob had a really really good point. But you also have to factor in the uh, the fact that. If you can do it with good humour, this doesn't mean being humorous, uh, what you are going to do is you are going to be able to have a, a, a communication. It, it's hard enough to put your own life in context, but we all know our own backstory. But it's about sometimes talking to somebody and while you're talking to them, while you're having a discussion, trying to put them into context, trying to think, you know, I, I, I will sometimes get comedy cross because Molly's my sort of daughter who lives with us. She won't know what year Charles Dickens was born. Right, so then I, then I do that whole thing. What? The, <laughs> what, the, what? But as it happens, she's a mental health triage nurse. She's a trained counsellor. She's got a world of skills. But, and she just goes, hey, so, but, so you're thinking about it. And you think, well, okay, she's not interested in Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. The sort of education she had was quite progressive. They weren't particularly interested in Charles Dickens. You can't just be cross because she doesn't know the date that Charles... Dickens lives, she's probably thinking, what sort of dinosaur knows the date that Charles Dickens was born? I, I don't want to read Great Expectations because the only time I ever saw a film of it, it was terrible. So you, you kind of have to make those mental judgments while you're talking to someone. And it's like, so if you're talking to a union steward, for example, or if you're talking to a comic, who's like, it's, instead of just going, no, you're wrong, I don't agree, you go, well, actually, why are they doing this? Well, well, well they've started doing their job. For a start, they might genuinely be concerned with the welfare of their workers, which they are. So you have to keep while you're having the outer dialogue and again this is this is where as a comedian as a performer I might find this easier because you're constantly as a performer as you know while you're while you're speaking to the audience 
you're multitasking. You're you're thinking about what's happening next. Have I left anything out? Why is that person yawning? So, right. so you're so gauging or constantly you're, you're constantly you're constantly changing the parameters of the gig, if you like. And so that's it becomes easier for me when I'm talking to somebody to 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 have that conversation in my head while I'm having the actual conversation out there. And I think that's I don't know if that's a skill you can teach, but it's certainly something that if you if you become I think, again, if you're if you're opening, yeah, we talked about I used as an example last time we spoke, somebody who opens up a baker's or a nail parlor or a barber shop and comes up with a, a title that's a pun or is funny. Right. Now, which I really like. So already you, instinctively you think, well, I'm going to choose that one. I'm going to choose that fish and chip shop because the name made me laugh. But again, it's about if you start that business, it's very much having to read new customers. If you start a new shop, reading the sort of people who come in, is this person, do they look like they seriously want to be here? Is it raining outside? How far can I push this person? It's like when somebody says to you in the shop, can I help you? And you say, no, I'm fine, thank you. You want them to go away then. You don't want them to say, are you sure I can't help you? And all of a sudden, I've just told you <laughs> you can't help it. Or if you go into a fast food, if you've got a hangover and you go into a KFC, for example, and you order something and say, do you want the meal? And because and, I'm polite, I say, no, thank you. But in, in my head, I'm going, did I say I want the meal? <laughs> And I know you're. I know you're told to do that because you have to meet targets. But again, they're making decisions all the time about the sort of customers in front of them. Is this person going to get belligerent if I say to them for a second time, "If you have the meal, you get the Fanta free," or is this person going to go, "Oh, actually, go on then." So they're always reading, but always having it. But it seems to me that in just in normal dialogue, even between friends, you just get impatient all the time. And and if you don't, if you don't have that dialogue. You, you just run the you become atrophied you become stiff you 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 stop you fossilize inside we, we know enough we all know comedians who are just so bitter and fossil because it's it's that classic i'm never sure if i get this the right way around you you don't you don't stop playing because you grow old you grow old because you stop playing stop playing yeah and it's i when well, the first time i heard that I thought, that's an that's an amazing thing because i thought I thought at the age of 20, you think 30 is unthinkable. You, but you wake up, you wake up when you're 30 and you think, well, actually, I still quite fancy dancing. I still quite fancy listening to music. And then you think 40. No one told me that at the age of, I'm 60 now. No one told me that at the age of 60, you'd still have insecurities and, and doubts and worries. And, and you, you're freelance. So sometimes you've got more money than, than other times. But you also, you still want to listen to music. Because and, and uh, Ali's brilliant because Ali loves music, new music. So you and you still go, well, I'm going, I'm going to listen to this. All right? I could just listen to Joy Division again, but why not listen to something new? And, and I find that remarkable. But I wish somebody had told me that. I wish somebody had told me that when I was younger that you still feel this way. It's just that you'll be closer to death than you are now. No, I think I think that's a choice, and and that's what I think humorology is about: is make good choices about bring new stuff in lightness of touch people i i think people close down you just heard about music i've 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 got all the music i yeah, need I now I, i've done the <laughs> sex, sex pistols and the clash and that's and that's my lot and, and i'm never going and now everything sounds like a derivation of of the sex pistols or uh, the clash or you know the sweet if we want to really go uh the old school but actually I think people do that with people as well. I've got my mates. Uh, yeah. I've got the but no, no. And it's kind of like some people get that thing like uh, uh, somebody introduces themselves and they might and they uh, they go no, um, thank you very much for your inquiry. Uh, we'll keep your details <laughs> on file. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And whereas I'm like constantly going, they're really interesting. <laughs> What can I learn from them? I'm excited about life and people. I mean, would, yeah, this is where I get cross. There's one comic in particular. It wouldn't be fair to name him, but I always say he, he just he hates new comics. He hates he just hates them all. And I always say to him, look, they're not. It's not one or the other. It's not you in and then them in and you out. You're still a brilliant comedian. You're still a really brilliant comedian. Yes, you're twice their age, but but they're not they're not here to deliberately take your day. They don't want your job. They've got their own ideas and ambitions and careers. They've probably never seen you perform comedy. You carry on doing what you you do, like I do. If you have to adapt to it, if you have to find another way of making people laugh, find it. But again, that that thing with the interest, you you meet somebody, and I know people go, I've got enough on my plate without having to listen to them. Or it's like you talk about, you might talk about the wider problems 
you know, in, in the world of, of starvation and you know, there's millions of tons of grain stored in Ukraine that can't get to people and people will say, well, that's nothing I can do about it. And, and it's, that's true in a way, but it's like, well, we can talk about it. We can talk about one of the things. It's like when you meet somebody, you know, I, I, I'm, I, always, I love meeting new people. And it, it's also that idea about making choices as well. It's also, I think as well, and this, this works in a business situation, sometimes having to think to yourself or constantly thinking to yourself, actually. And I think this relates to business. I mean, if you've, if you've opened a fish and chip shop, uh, in the middle of Mayfair, for example, you're probably constantly thinking to yourself, have I done the right thing here? Opening a greasy spoon fish and chip shop in the middle of Mayfair. In the same way that if you were to open a freestyle French restaurant in Thornton Heath, you'd be constantly saying, have I done the right thing here? And I think, I think the most interesting people in life are those people who are constantly saying to themselves, am I doing the right thing here? Is this the right business model? Is this the right place? But also those people who have the courage to go, no, I've made the wrong decision. This, I've, I've started this business at the wrong time or in the wrong place. Is there a way I can get out of this? No, there isn't. Let's, let's move on. Because again, we have this terrible thing. We're all, you know, Samuel Beckett, I believe, he said, you know, fail, try again, fail better. But we have this terrible fear now of failure, and, and rightly so, because you could financially ruin yourself or other people. But sometimes you just have to go, I've got this wrong. As you do as a comedian, you in your head, you start a routine and you go, I've got this wrong, I'm going to change it. Sometimes that's the bravest thing to do well, in, but, in any way, walk of life. But I, I, I think you've used a really interesting word, bravery and, and, and being brave. I think that's what uh, it is. Uh, the bravery uh, to actually come out of your comfort zone and go, it's a new person. And, uh, I, you know, I... <laughs> I had an interaction on Saturday with a homeless person, hmm. which absolutely shook me. Uh, it, but it shook me in a, uh, an extraordinary way because of what they, how brilliant their communication was. And this was, a, and I don't want to say it, a horribly, but a scabby looking young bloke outside a tube who, and his humanity and his uh, humor changed everything about the way and he led that and he taught me something with it and when I went to shake his hand he said I won't shake your hand because I've got too much respect for you wow. and I sleep in a bin and there's bin juice all over my hand wow and I'm like Jesus I mean I couldn't give him money quick enough and I don't know what he spent it on. I don't care it's not it's, important do you know what's interesting about a couple of weeks ago we did a live show live podcast show in in Accrington um and we all went back to the hotel in in Blackburn it was quite late there's like a, a small it's a group brilliant of, podcast by the way thank Absolutely. you very much everybody should but, um one of the people that had come with us who was involved with Accrington Stanley Club their son was with them and this this chap had said to me there's no point talking to him you don't get much out of him he's not a communicator but he, he just started to laugh at something. and he looked again he looked he's quite shabbily dressed and we just got talking and it turned out he was he worked for a homeless charity because he'd been street homeless himself for for quite some time and we got talking about all the old cliches that people say you know well they, they're not they might not be real beggars and, and it's like he said yeah they, they might not be real beggars there are people like that about but if they're not you've lost a pound uh, and, this, and this whole thing he said he said you can ask you can say to somebody do you want money or do you want a sandwich or a coffee? Let them make the decision. Let, let them make the choice. And he said, also, if you're giving somebody money and they do spend it on really strong alcohol, if you've given them the wherewithal to have 20 minutes off life or 20 minutes away, and he said, because no one, no one chooses to be home. But it's like, again, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good guardian reading liberal about these things. It's, this, is, this is terrible, but it's the first time I've had a conversation with somebody who's street homeless. I mentioned last time on the pod that Ed knows every homeless person by, by name on, on Dean Street front, because he's always stopped to talk to them. This is the first time I've had a conversation with somebody and you go, oh my God. And, and what you come away thinking is, please, for the love of God, don't let my life go that way. And, 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 stop, and now it's stop judging people. Stop saying, because sometimes your first reaction is, right, I'm a good white liberal here, good Western liberal, I'll give them two pounds. But at the same time, you go, oh, mate, how have you come to this? surely there's something you can do but so that 
at, that's gone now. That attitude completely. It's like it's not my problem. But, but to come back to what you're saying before about the that decision to to stop doing something. It's like I did last time I did Edinburgh. Deborah Francis White. Uh, coming out of the comfort zone. And then Deborah Francis White is a brilliant improviser. She had this show where stand-ups improvise on their own on stage. And she she persuaded me to do it with the help of Phil Jupiter's. And so the idea is that you as a stand-up, you're on stage for half an hour. She sort of interviews you. But the first thing she says was, by the way, you're not Kevin Dana, you're a bee, and you've just fallen into a cup. So how are you getting out of the cup? So and it was, I found it so what I learned was. Despite all my my previous attitude to improvisation, I learned that I really thoroughly enjoyed it. I also learned that I'm never going to do it again. Never going to do it again because I, I've I've done it now, and I'd realised that I'm never going to be as good at that as I am at stand up comedy. So it was a brilliant experience, but also at the same time that experience was made richer by knowing I didn't have to do it again. Well, it's very interesting because I, I actually, when the Comedy Store players first started, I did it with them for about a year and a half. And mm. you remember when Mike Myers and Neil Malarkey yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they used to, uh, and we used to, they, Mike Myers trained us all with Paul Merton and everybody, trained us all how to do it. And then we did it. And I, you know, I did it for about a year, year and four months. I discovered that I was decent at it. Yeah. And I, right. and yeah. you know, I, I, they, I wasn't, I mean, well, obviously, I was with Mike Myers, <laughs> Norman Lucky, Paul Merton, Josie Lawrence, you know, Sandy Toxvig. Uh, and and you suddenly go, yeah, I've done it. I, I've, I'm reasonable at it. I don't love it like you have to love it. But also, I don't think I'm I'm going to ever be brilliant at it. So I've done that'll do. Stand up comedians are very good improvisers. So we improvise as we're doing stand up, basically. Of course, you do. You, mm. you adapt to different circumstances. The reason we don't tend to make good improvisers in a group is because we want to get the laugh. Facilitating somebody else to get the laugh isn't really on the agenda. And also, what you want to do is break the rules. And I, I used to get cross sometimes with 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 the, the comedy store players because they would you know they would ask for suggestions. They would say, right, we want you to tell us this. We want you to tell us where we're going. We want you to give us a, a job or whatever, which is great. But then if an audience member tried to join in when they weren't asked, they would get really cross and not know how to deal with it. It's like you should, you at least should be able to improvise your way out of this situation. But what, what is fascinating is, is that you talk, you spoke then about um, being taught how to improvise, about training, about taking 18 months to teach you. Well, how to improvise. That? I know, but, 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 but my point is that in America, in America, every town and city that's got a comedy club will have an improv club because they take it, they take it far more seriously as an art form than we do here. Like some actors will do improv classes. Most people who do improv in this country, and it's not we haven't got a big improv tradition in this country, despite the um, no. whose line is it anyway? Whatever, it's not a huge thing. Most people will go to see stand up or music rather than improv. But the idea that you can actually teach improv is a fascinating one for me because it's counterintuitive. Oh yeah. But again, it does come back to you know, the, the most efficient communicators, the most efficient training officers or training staff are the ones who can think on their feet, are the ones who, you know, because it's 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 simple enough to devise a training module. It's not simple. I, I bet that's disrespectful to training officers. It's, it's not. But they're easy to, to access and locate. You can find a book or find a, 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 you know, a website that will give you a training. Like you can find a, a best man speech, for example. But... Yeah. It's how you communicate that information to people. And the, and the best training people, the ones that do it with enthusiasm, energy, the ones that are do, they may have done it five times that week, but they still give you the impression this is the first time that they've done it. They give you the impression that you're the best group of, of students they've had that week and that they're really impressed with your level of feedback and knowledge. They give you encouragement. And because, and, again, it's like an audience. If you're, if you're being taught trained it's very quick for you to see through the people who aren't particularly keen on doing it who are going through the motions who are, who are giving you the information but you're not taking that information in because you're you're distracted by the, the lack of enthusiasm or the lack of energy well but the best trainers in the world are having done a lot of training all over the world really it's about keeping them in the room and entertained and then putting in the education around that it took me too long to learn this. It took me till I was nearly leaving to learn this. That 
it's about realizing as well that apart from the novelty of being away from their station or away from their classroom or away from their workplace Mm -hmm. most people that you are talking to on a training course don't want to be there they really would rather not be there they'd rather be back at work if that's all right with you they'd rather be with their other things they're with strangers normally They, they don't I find people here don't respond well to being back in a classroom situation again and it's almost impossible to not replicate the classroom situation so it took me too long to realize that because it would have changed my attitude towards I always tried to be light-hearted and jokey and, and jovial when I was doing training modules and presenting information but if I'd realized at an earlier date that these people really don't want to be here and, and again it's it's like when you do I don't do corporates I hate doing corporates there, there isn't enough money in the world to induce me to do corporates anymore because you know the last thing they want even if it's Jimmy Carr or Lee Mack coming up the last thing they want they're at their Christmas party with their mates they're half drunk already the last thing they want is the the CEO getting up and say well here's my, my favorite comics coming along now for half an hour you don't it's, it's like why and then you go all right I'll, 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 up you get and they're not, it's, it's not an audience. And so it's the same with people in, in training environments. They don't really want to be there. And so you have to acknowledge that. And But sometimes, of course, that involves you going, well, actually, if I acknowledge that, that undermines my whole my whole role. This because training's important. They should know that training's important. If, yeah. And if they don't it's know that... It's about pre-framing, though, isn't it? It's about pre-framing. It's a good, that's, and a good, get, that's a good phrase. It's a good word. And, yeah. and going, look, I get it. You don't have to explicitly say... I, uh, the point of today is to have some fun and stick some, uh, uh, you know, learning in between the fun. And, and you know what I also found out, Paul? And again, this relates to audiences. I, I found out, again, too late, that most people, because we would always do feedback. Out, so again, early in the 80s, you didn't get a lot of feedback sessions. You didn't tend to ask. You might say to somebody, was that of any use? And they'd go, yeah, of course it was. But you didn't have formal feedback or reporting back sessions but when we started to do that towards the end of my time there what I found was that so many of them part of the reluctance to be there was that they were terrified that they would be tested at the end yeah. or that in a week's time somebody would turn up and say uh what was what was it they told you about the uh, pregnancy regulations uh for somebody a woman who's and they were terrified of that they were terrified that they would have to use this new knowledge so again but the bizarre thing is that actually uh, there's been a lot of social science around this the, the more relaxed they are the more they remember of course of course <laughs> it's, it's it's and again they would you and a lot of time you're talking about older men and women officers who are used to being the ones who do the explaining and, and were again reluctant to take notes from somebody who's much younger than them they know that they they know it's important for them to find out what you do if a woman is maternity pay blah, blah. they know it's important to find out what you do if a man is is getting off his face on internox but at the same time they don't really want you to be that they don't want to be taking notes because they, they already think they, they they know it's which is why it's always i found easier to to train and instruct younger officers younger members of staff who always who were closer to the school experience or the university experience yeah. and hadn't been out of it for as long as some of them has. But it's like, it, it, it's about, because in the end, I realised that those problems that they had were were mine to resolve or ours as a person, as a human resources department. They, those problems were ours to resolve, not theirs. It wasn't up to us to, to, to tell them that their attitude has to be different. It's up to us to make sure their attitude is different. Which goes back to where we came in on that point, which is the meaning of your communication is the response you get. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin, you and I can talk all day. and We've already (laughs) talked for two days. And this time I'm determined to get quick fire questions in. Okay. I can't guarantee quick fire answers, as you can can tell. (laughs) And they don't have to be. (laughs) Quick fire questions. So, who is the funniest business person? Somebody away from the comedy scene, it can be in the the business of television or film. Who's the funniest business person that you've met? That's a good question because you don't always associate business with funny. My my, my first boss, Kevin Aylward, at the Amnesty Service, was very very funny. Uh, which is one of the reasons I liked working with him so much. Although you had to work out when you can, you had to stop being funny back because he was, after all, your 
your boss. Mm-hmm. And and what I find is, of course, I, I hear the word show biz, business every day, but it's always tacked on to the word show. It's like, and a friend of mine, Jim Piddock, I did a book launch for him. He, he's launched his new book. He's a Hollywood actor. He was in Best in Show. You'd recognise him. But he taught, and it's interesting, and the British audience was slightly diffident about him doing so because he talked about show business has two words in show and business. And the business is very important. You have to make sure you get paid as much as you deserve. You have to make sure you walk. And, and for English audiences, that's kind of like, should we, should we have to talk about money? Come on now. Yes, you know, yeah. You've got a good career. So that's interesting. But I, I think there's a writer called, his name, full name is Bob Fraser Steele, Fraser Steele. He's from Berwick, uh, who is naturally the funniest person I've ever met or worked with. He's he's just his mind. I, I make connections very quickly. His mind is like a, a supercomputer. He just makes connections. He links things up really quickly. He's very very funny. He can be quite dry and quite sharp. And if he refers to himself as a pantomime villain, but if you don't know him, you could be wounded by some of the things he says. But he's hilarious. But you put him in front of, of four people to try and be funny and he can't do it. And he, by his own admission, I always say to him, you should be a stand-up. No, I couldn't. I'm terrified. Really terrified. Mm. But it's uh, he's probably the answer. But I, it, it's strange because my business is full of people who are funny or meant to be funny for a living. Well, as I talked about in the in the, the first pod we did, I, it's, it's always in, intriguing to me that when you get a lot of comedians together, you in a room you will have the first five minutes of jostling for position and doing a couple of jokes. And then you will just talk like normal people yeah. until another, until a civilian comes in when you all revert to being funny again. It's, <laughs> it's comedians like the, the chance not to be funny on occasions. But I, I think, I think Fraser Steele will be the answer, but it's, it's like, I never, although I was fairly sort of, I was sort of senior middle management, if you like, by the end, but I was never high enough to share in the banter with the, the, the managers that were in a different building. You see what I mean? So humor, it's an interesting one associating business with humour, which is odd because your podcast is all about finding ways to do that. Well, brilliant answer. What book makes you laugh, Kevin? I love Terry Pratchett. Uh, most well, the, fir- the first three and the last three, not so much. I-, I remember hearing somebody say about Desert Island Discs. One of the like, one of the presenters saying, "You always knew when an answer had been given to someone by somebody else to make them seem." intellectual it's like you always knew if somebody went oh of course Shostakovich but not the sixth the 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 fifth like somebody's told you that too much detail Um, so 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 this so this one might sound like the sort of thing but I find Charles Dickens very funny Charles David Copperfield which I'm rereading at the moment just makes me laugh out loud but it's partly because I love the way Charles Dickens writes obviously but he just it's full of asides and I like that I love the fact he would just break off to tell even the start of the Christmas Carol when he says I I you know why we say dead as a doornail or not dead as a coffee now i like that sort of diversion but the book that makes me laugh the most is the master of margarita by bulgarkov i don't know that. which was written in uh he wrote it while he's in an asylum in in Russia, about 1926 uh, it's it's partly said that there, there are little chapters uh, mini chapters that are pilot talking to christ before and it's just basically christ going there's been a terrible misunderstanding. I really don't know how this has happened. People are following, but writing his words, are writing them down, and Pilot trying to get him out of the situation. That's funny. But the main part of the book is that the devil and three of his demons decide to come down to, to Russia in 1926 to cause some, some trouble, to stir things up a bit. And one of the demons is a, a, a very sarcastic cat, which is I, 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 something I would, in, a, in the next life, I want to come back as a sarcastic cat. I love cats and I love sarcasm. But the, the, and it's a really funny book because it, it turns out they get very disappointed because there's nothing they can do that humanity hasn't already done. They, they try and fuck things over, but we've already done it. And it, their, their attempts to find something to, to cause trouble with is, is just hilarious. But also Volkarkov's description of authority, even down to like tram conductors and, and as far up as a politburo, it's, it's hilarious. It's really, it's really genuinely funny. And it's one of those books that you find yourself going back to. Just tell uh, us the name again, because I don't want the people Master, scrolling back. It's called The Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. The Master yeah. and Margarita by Bulgakov. Yeah. I, I will give it a go. Okay. Definitely. What film makes you laugh? Well, at the other end of the intellectual scale, uh, I, I love 
the best in show I love. I think best in show is oh. is funny, but always Lauren Hardy. It's always Lauren Hardy. Always come back to Lauren Hardy for me. Uh, partly because one of my earliest memories is sitting on my dad's knee watching Lauren Hardy, and it was snowing on the Lauren Hardy thing and snowing outside. And I'm mean, thinking, this is brilliant. How's my dad worked out? It's really clever. <laughs> Oh. But also, they just make me laugh so much. And and what's interesting for this pod as well, as I was thinking about this last night, it's amazing how many uh, Laurel and Hardy films are about them starting a new business. You know, where they become fishmongers or chimney sweeps. Yeah. In, in one of them, Ollie has this brilliant idea that they will become Christmas card salesmen, but they'll do it in July because no one else is selling <laughs> Christmas cards in July. <laughs> but there's this whole, they always have this arc, but they always have this optimism. Whatever Whatever plan they come up with, and it's always a good plan, but they managed to, to muck it up. But there's one piece of dialogue in a film called Thicker Than Water when it's the classic one where uh, James Finlayson, is, he comes to collect the HB payments on the furniture and the, the small wife um, says, I, 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 you got paid that yesterday. He, he's, his response is steady woman. And she says, but I gave, I gave my husband $37. And so she says, what did you do with the money, you big girl? He said, I gave it to Stan. And so she says to Stan, what did you do with the $37? She said, I gave it back to Ollie to pay my rent. So then they have this whole thing. Was, was that the money that she gave to you to give to him to give to her? <laughs> and, it's, and it goes on, but it just, and it's a, it's a joyful, it's a, I laugh at that in a way I don't laugh at comedy because I'm not second guessing. And I can watch mm. it over and over again. And it just... Their relationship, their love, their, it comes back to your point about you and Ainsley. Uh, even though they were so different, I mean, Stan, it, uh, most people don't realise that Ollie, as soon as filming was over, Ollie would disappear to the golf course golf or the course, racetrack. Yeah. Stan was the businessman. Stan was a, a very good businessman. And who wrote it as and well. He wrote, he? directed, produced, worked out the stunts. He had very bright red hair and very piercing blue eyes, which was a problem for him in the early years of, of black and white film. His problem was the, the ladies, so most of the money he made, he lost. But he was a very shrewd businessman. But they still talked about their love for each other. And when they were on set together, they just loved each other's company. And it's that shines through. And there's a certain, not childishness, but childlikeness about them, which which makes me... It's just joyful. It's that's what it is. It's just it, again. It's like watching your double act. It's, it's one of the you just you just think, don't analyze it. it don't it's, really don't analyze. Just give yourself up to it for twenty minutes, and just think. Do you know what? That's fine. The the, the world is a better place for that twenty minutes. And that's how I feel about Laurel and Hardy films. You just feel that slightly better about the world, and it's like not every comic has to be Mark Thomas or me trying to do topical stuff or bringing down a government although we brought Thatcher down in the end I have to say it took us 11 years but we got her down in the end we wore we, we winkled her out in the end with our, our one-liners and our well, puritan I, comedy well this is my favorite interview ever that even you mentioning the Calypso twins in the same breath as Laurel and Hardy <laughs> I would, um, well, if you ever do a reunion tour, put that on the poster. As good as Lauren Hardy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, I, I, do you know, I, talking about posters, Ains and I and Jeremy Hicks uh, were in Soho House and Jeremy Hicks said to Kim Kinney, let's bring it full circle, what would the Calypso twins bill matter be? <laughs> and Kim straight away went subtle as fuck. <laughs> I did um, one of the first things I did on TV. I was appearing on TV, and it was, it was a, I was really pleased because a couple of the camera crew were proper old fashioned seventies union men, uh, and it's like you know somebody went to pull a plug out. It's like oh yeah, whoa whoa whoa, wrong union. You can't do that, which just made me laugh a lot. Uh, but one of them introduced himself to me. So on camera one, he went, uh, he said, "I won't be laughing." I went, "Oh, that's reassuring to know." He said, "Well, I didn't laugh at Morecambe and Wise. I ain't gonna laugh at you." So I just spent the whole day saying, Camel One says I'm as good as Morecambe and Wise. I, I'm as funny as Morecambe. He got really <laughs> upset about it. So he was saying, no, I didn't. I said, they were shit as well. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a fucking critic. Um, let's take a shift to the other side because we talked earlier on and we have um, the young men, uh, our children in our lives. And... Uh, everything's changing now 
to you, what's not funny? I mean, there are, there are subjects I wouldn't talk about. And this is a question um, that I knew might come up because you did hint, you were kind enough to give me an indication of one or two questions that might come up. I, I think this is the most difficult question of all the questions that you asked me. And, and you can tell because your experience that I'm now, even though I knew it might come up, I'm still biding time. I'm giving myself thinking room. It's, it's a really difficult question. So I, I don't think there's anything intrinsically that can't be made funny. There are things that I wouldn't be comfortable talking about, but as we spoke about before, I made my wife's cancer treatment into a show and, and that was funny. There's a, a comment, I forget his name, he won the uh, Perrier Award for a show about male rape, which he was so, which he made into a brilliantly funny show. I think, I think everything, there's, there's potential humour in everything. It just depends what the reason is that you're finding humour in it. If you're, I hate, I hate cruel jokes. I hate the comedy of cruelty. I hate people. There was a time in the nineties when you would set people up, you'd set celebrities up and, and ask them, you know, Chris Morris would, would humiliate them by saying, well, there's this new drug. Will you cake. Eat cake? You know, and, and then they would say, they would say, uh, well, look at this idiot. He was so desperate to get on telly. He, he, he's talking, whereas basically you've got a kindly old lady who's, who's trying to help people. So I hate, I hate the comedy of humiliation. I hate people who tell, uh, I, occasionally I like bad taste jokes. Of course I do, but not if they're about somebody specific. But I think at the essence of what you're saying is nothing should be crossed off the list and nobody should be in charge of uh, policing that. I don't think there should be any taboos, but I think that doesn't mean I understand people who think there should be taboos. And it, it doesn't mean that I think you should be chasing taboos just for effect, just to be known as the taboo busting comedian. Mark Thomas and I did Loose Talk together. We did this particular routine uh, about what had happened. It's about whether God was male or female, essentially. But this routine, the Bishop of Oxford took exception at this routine, uh, complained to the BBC, and we were said we'd we had to read out the complaint because the BBC governors upheld the complaint. So we had to read out two weeks later. We're very sorry. Uh, we understand. We've been told by Ofcom or whatever it was then that that routine offended three of the major four faith groups. So to those Hindus who feel left out, please accept our apologies. And we did this routine about throwing a bun to Ganesh. Right, which was childish and it's all but it, it led to the best letter of complaint that I've ever ever got so because those were the days before the internet thank thank the lord thank god there's no twitter then but this young man wrote in to say uh, I'm a Hindu I love the show I love stand-up comedy uh and I'm a Hindu so I was really pleased to hear that we very rarely get mentioned we very rarely get included it made me and my mates laugh a lot my mum and dad are furious but it's a great uh, thank you for, so much for doing jokes about Hindus P.S. You two are fucked in the next life. Uh, it, just, it just made me laugh so much because it dealt with the situation so, so well, so properly, oh, yeah. so mature. But and again, and again, we would we deliberately did that, but we weren't do it. We weren't saying right. Well, let's upset Hindus. We, the first the first routine wasn't deliberate. Well, our aim wasn't to say right. How can we upset people? Our aim was, well, let's explore this, this issue because it was around the time that women priests were coming in and people saying, you can't have a women priest. So it's in context. So it's like, I, I think you can explore everything, but not if you're just doing it deliberately to, to cause effect. And also there are some comics who get two years out of, you know, shock, horror, taboo busting. But it, it wears thin in the end. Mm -hmm. It wears thin. It really does. Yeah, I agree. That was, I'm still laughing. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? In, in terms of what I do for a living, I think I better plump for funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, essentially, I'm probably in the wrong job. Do you think that in order to be funny, you have to be clever? Is that not a, a proviso? I don't think I've ever met a comedian who isn't clever. Mm. And I think that's partly because they've got a lot of time on their hands for a start off. Comedians tend to be very well read and, and you know, you, you generally have got a lot of time on your hands. They tend to be interested in the world, most of them. And also your, if your job is to put things together, you know, it, it, our job is not to put two and two together and make four. 
is to put two and two together and make round of applause. So when your job is to make connections that the audience can't make, because if you're not making audience connections, the audience can't make, then there's no point you being there. So I think there is a certain element of you have to be clever to be a comedian or you need sly cunning, at least. I would I would like, I was gonna say, I, I, I can't say this in all honesty, that I would like to be considered a clever comedian when I've just told a joke about throwing a bun <laughs> in the I can't, that would be slightly hypocritical of me to do that. But I, I've, I'm actually very proud that I've been funny for a living because it wasn't something I ever expected to do when I was younger. My interests were history and archaeology and basically I was never going to be a historian or an archaeologist so I might have ended up teaching history but that would have been it. But I've become a comedian and a writer and it's taken me to places and to people that I never thought I would ever go. I am proud of being of being funny. So yeah, funny's funny is the answer to that question. That's a great answer. And finally, Kevin, desert island gags. You can only <laughs> take one gag with you to a desert island. What well, is it? I'm, I'm going to have to discount two of them because I can only have one, but two of them have got the C word in. Uh, one of them only once, but one of them 27 times but you know I've discount. <laughs> but my my favorite joke uh and Ali is, is again it's one of those things you get after 28 years of marriage that Ali knows I have to I have to do it I have to say it if we if we ever walk into a pub or any building if we ever go to a, a, a castle or a house and there's a stuffed animal's head on the wall I have to say he must have been going at some speed when he hit that wall I have to do it, and it it just makes me laugh. I just love doing it, and because I love because people. I remember Ed was about four. I remember doing it, and it just it took him a second to work out what I meant, and he rolled about laughing. And Ali, it's like me watching. Ali smiles because she knows that I'm going to do it, and she knows that I'm going to enjoy doing it. And when you do it, even if if there's four animal heads on the wall, I will do it four times. I I have to do it. And it, it just, it, I, I think it was originally a Tony Hancock joke, I think. Yeah. Um, I was, I've always loved Gordon and Simpson because they were from down the road for me. Uh, um, one was from Wallington, one was from Stretton Vale. So within a mile of where I grew up. So, and then when, that's one of the things you find out later on in life. You go, oh, I wouldn't have minded knowing that when I was a kid. That would have given you a little bit of a boost knowing that somebody like that was from there. But yes. I think I think it's a, a, a Hancock joke, but it just... It feels me if we go somewhere to the extent that I literally, if, if we go, we very rarely get time for a day out now because Ali's working so much. But if we if we say let's go somewhere, let's have lunch, go to a pub we haven't been to, I'm literally in the car for 15 minutes going, <laughs> please let there be a moose head, please let there be some kind of stuffed animal, please, please. And if there's not, she knows that I'm going to be disappointed if there isn't. <laughs> it's like, but it just makes me laugh all the time. It's the most basic, simple, stupid joke. It just Aww. it just makes me laugh all the time. Oh, that's a brilliant way and a brilliant way to end. You've been not only fabulous, fun, but you definitely says comedy on the door and you are <laughs> very, you very, very funny. Thank you so much, Kevin, for being our guest on the Humorology Podcast. Thank you for having me again. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.